Hello and welcome to The Daily Space. It is Friday, it is almost the end of the week, but it is not the end of all the sciences coming towards you. Uh, Yesterday I was able to say there were amazing embargoed stories that I couldn't wait to bring you. And yet again today we have received many more embargoed stories. This time, hey, thank you, Trekker Kev. Um, this time the embargoed stories are set for July 2nd. It's uh, one of those times when, well, all the embargoes are kind of awesome. And uh, I can just say, stay tuned and awesome things are coming. So for today's first big story, this is one that I wasn't able to give you yesterday. We have an update on Supernova 1987A. Now, those of you who are old enough to remember may remember that this supernova was actually bright enough that you could observe it with your eyeballs if you happen to be located uh, in the southern hemisphere. It is a supernova that went off in the Large Magellanic Cloud and delighted us with our ability to see it expand and interact with the surrounding material. Now, in this image that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 2010, we're able to see how over the 13 years of this supernova's life, it evolved and changed. Now, uh, Here in the heart of the supernova, we have a bright ring of material. That bright ring of material is actually about a light year across. This means that in 13 years, the light and the shock waves were able to expand that ring out. Now, if you look carefully, there's also this figure eight of material. We're not actually sure what exactly is causing that. One theory is that we're looking at something that is shaped uh, kind of like an hourglass seen at an angle where you have a tight waist in the center, that bright light you're across ring that you see there, and then two expanding spheres coming off of that, which we see only the edges of in the form of these rings. Now, this is just one theory, but we're not entirely sure if it's the correct theory. But what we do know now, thanks to amazing radio observations, is that in just the two decades that this particular object has been in existence. It has managed to shock and align the particles around us using its magnetic fields. Now I'm going to zoom in to this uh, diagram that I have here on the right, where this ring of material matches this ring of material here. As I zoom in on this, you can start to make out lines that are pointing in a variety of directions in this image. These lines are mapping out the magnetic field that has been stretched out to span this area of space by the supernova. Now, it's long been known that supernova remnants are associated with large magnetic fields. What was unclear was exactly how long it took for the magnetic field from the supernova to add order to the region of space surrounding it. Now we know this is a process that occurs very quickly. And looking at this, um, what's kind of amazing is just how much detail we're able to get. Now, for those of you who don't know a lot about magnetic fields and how we detect them, one of the ways we look for them is to look at how light rays are aligned. Light photons, this is a manifestation of the electromagnetic field is one way to look at it. Light is both a particle and a wave and how these waves line up, rotate as they travel through space has to do with, well, particles that they've reflected off of and magnetic fields that they've interacted with. Using radio telescopes, we can very carefully measure how these waves are aligned and get at the exact polarization arising from different parts of this supernova remnant. Um, So here we have, using radio telescopes, 
very careful observations of the magnetic field in supernova 1987a's surrounding nebula. Now, this isn't a particularly strong magnetic field, and here I go back to giving you both the optical image and the radio image with the magnetic field side by side. In fact, this magnetic field is 50 thousand times weaker than your average refrigerator magnet. Luckily, it doesn't take that much force to have a big effect in our universe. Uh, space is mostly empty, and sometimes all it takes is a little bit of effort or a little tiny magnetic field to line things up into amazing science. Now, continuing on our journey of polarization and reflected light, uh, this time we have an object that's a little bit closer to consider. This is Patheon, or at least an artist's rendition. Thank you, Scott, so much for the uh, subscription. Uh, so this is a artist's rendition of the near-Earth object, a small asteroid called Patheon. This particular object is one that is destined to be explored by the Destiny Probe. This little mission is going to go and give us a close-up view of this rather unusual object. We, we know that this particular asteroid, we think, um, we think it's an asteroid, is responsible for the Geminid meteor shower. This is one of the few meteor showers that is tied to a asteroid instead of to a comet. Now, the reason I'm saying asteroid like that is this is a weird object. As we look at it, we can see it expelling dust, and it is possible that perhaps this is the leftover remnant of a comet, although generally it's believed it's just a weird asteroid. Uh, so this particular unusual object, as we lead up to its, well, spacecraft encounter has been getting a lot of observations from here on the planet Earth. And one of the things that we've been finding is the light that it reflects back at us from the sun is not only bluer than what we normally expect to see reflected off of rocks, but it's also unusually polarized. This indicates that its surface is quite unusual compared to that of many other objects, including planets and other asteroids. The way that we get highly polarized uh, light reflecting off of an asteroid is to have a very specific kind of surface. Now, many of you may wear polarized sunglasses when you're out driving. This is because sunlight reflecting off of the highway, which is a dark, non-reflective for the most part surface tends to all be well polarized in one specific way by how it reflects with just a single scattering event off the road and into your eyeballs. With brighter surfaces, with white cement for instance, sunlight hitting the surface may get reflected multiple times before it scatters back to your eyeballs this multiple scattering kind of pathway a photon might take will erase any polarization, any alignment of the rays of light that polarizing sunglasses may have a hope of, well, protecting you from. With darker asphalt, you in many cases only have this single reflection and all the light has essentially a single alignment. And thus, having sunglasses that are polarized to block against that one particular alignment is sufficient to making your driving experience all that much better. Now you can see if your sunglasses have this kind of polar polarization often by doing a simple experiment with the LCD screen on a camera or on some mobile phones. Put on your sunglasses, look at that LCD screen, turn it at a right angle and watch it disappear. Uh, this is also a good way to freak people out by convincing them your camera is broken when indeed all you've done is rotate at 90 degrees. Well, in looking at this asteroid, it is possible that its surface, like asphalt, is that particular kind of dark where light doesn't so much scatter as it gets absorbed. And the light we do see has only undergone that one single reflection, leading to, well, a highly polarized uh, 
set of light being sent back towards the detectors here on Earth. Now another option is that this is a surface that is extraordinarily porous and is rich in, well, grains of material that are created when this asteroid gets significantly heated up when it gets close to the sun. This, this particular asteroid can get up to 1000 degrees centigrade. At this temperature, some rocks will split, forming grains. These grains, in turn, may cause light to, again, not be able to go through multiple scatterings, but instead just have a single reflection that reflects the the sizes of the grains is in fact a outcome of the sizes of the grain on this asteroid. Now exactly what the cause of this polarized light might be, we can't really tell without further information. And this is where I am happy to say there is a spacecraft on its way to this particular rock. Again, the Destiny probe coming from the European Space Agency will be checking out this rock and helping us understand just what it is um, that may be causing this particular asteroid, whether it be an asteroid, a dead comet, or just something really unique, uh, will help us understand what causes this asteroid to be as weird and scientifically interesting as it appears to be. Now, we have one more rocky story for today, and this is a tale of near-Earth asteroids. This summer, in Garching, Germany, outside of the city of Munich, scientists have been meeting to discuss the implications of how we are and how we aren't searching for near-Earth asteroids. Currently, and not just asteroids, but in fact any near-Earth object, currently we're looking for these teles for looking we're looking for these potentially hazardous objects using a pair of observational facilities that are funded by the United States. Using these different survey uh, instruments, we're able to turn up things on a fairly regular basis, but we only check out the entire sky every couple of weeks. This means that there's a high probability that we could miss small objects on their way to hit the planet Earth that just happened to slip into the survey's fields while the telescopes were pointed somewhere else. This was brought home to us a couple of weeks ago when, as we discussed here on The Daily Space, an object that was about six feet across was detected only a few hours before it hit the Earth's atmosphere and burned up over the nation of Botswana. This particular object didn't actually pose any risk to our planet and life on its surface. But other objects have been a bit more dangerous and have snuck up on us with no warning in the past. Some of you may remember back in 2015 uh, on Valentine's Day or the day after, depending on where you are in the world, a fairly significant object blew up over the city of Chelyabinsk, Russia. Learning how to detect these objects before they actually, well, hit our atmosphere and have the potential to harm life and property is something that we'd really like to get to the point that we're able to do. During this meeting in, in uh, Garching, Germany, uh, folks discussed what is necessary to protect us. I imagine, if you will, if Chelyabinsk's uh, encounter had been predicted and we'd been able to say, hey everyone, when you see that flash of light, get away from your window because the in incoming shockwave is going to shatter it. And if you're looking out the window, as many people did, you just might get harmed by that shattering window breaking in your face. I wish that that was some passing shade on people who didn't know not to look out windows, but sadly, uh, this is something that actually occurred, and because of human nature, if you see a flash coming through your window, people in the future will continue to get up and look out their window. And even worse, it could be that the objects that hit our atmosphere in the future don't blow up in the sky, but instead continue to the surface where they harm people and property, as happened a few weeks ago in China when a small object blew up over western China and broke through windows and broke into homes. Um, 
It's now known that our current multi-week cadence for observing the entire sky is not enough. And we see that the European Space Agency is working on planning a new project that will be able to observe the entire sky every 48 hours. And on the heels of that particular observatory, there are also future US plans to up our cadence to observing the entire sky every one 24-hour period. Now these particular observatories, because they're trying to explore the sky so quickly, will not be able to identify the faintest objects, but hopefully they'll be able to detect the nearest objects that we're actually in potential danger from. Now in order to be able to detect all the objects, or at least most of the ones that are big enough to cause harm to our planet, we're all going to have to just wait for the large Synoptic Survey Telescope. When it comes online in the coming years, it will be able to see the entire sky on a fairly regular basis. Exactly how often that is has changed every few years, and I have to admit I'm going to wait for the telescope to launch before I say just how frequency it's going to get its job done. Now, with its particular big mirror and ability to do big science, it is hoping to find all the objects along the main disk of our solar system. It will continue to leave us vulnerable to things on orbits that are perpendicular to the plane that all the planets currently orbit in, but it will begin to fill in the gaps in our knowledge. So like the dinosaurs, we continue to be at risk of asteroid impact. But because of our telescopes and because of our science, we are working towards having early warning systems. And there are other scientists out in the world working to devise ways to hopefully deflect in a less uh, crazy and Armageddon style than we see in the movies, any incoming objects. If we detect them early enough, Deflection might be as simple as going out and painting them white so they reflect sun, sunlight a little bit differently and themselves get deflected by sunlight a little bit differently. Uh, many other possibilities for how we can move asteroids also exist. It's just a matter of finding them with enough advanced warning. Now, those are today's big news stories. I would encourage you to come back on Monday because I already have seen a preview of news that we have to bring you, and it's kind of exciting. Now, I will start to take your questions. I would ask, can you please at me in the chat so I can see your questions stand out uh, against all of the different discussion going on? This has been The Daily Space, and as it says above me, I am Dr. Pamela Gay. This program is brought to you by a multi-institutional collaboration. We have hosts that come on on various days, including Dr. Matt Richardson, who will be following up this episode with uh, his Astro 101 program. Uh, he comes to us from the Planetary Science Institute, and his student, our coder, uh, Big J, uh, he is is also with me at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And uh, on Sundays, we have Sunday Science brought to you by Youngstown State University's Annie Wilson. And uh, returning next week to help me with hosting the daily show is Dr. Andreas Plazas. Now, if you like what you see, please give us a follow so you can get updated every time we go live. We are organized through the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, a 501c3 nonprofit. And, uh, you know, your subscriptions are what sustains us, and every bit really helps. So now I am here to take all your questions. Uh, and we have Big J in the comments. Um, so scrolling back back, I see Hanny is asking, could we see an asteroid coming a few years ahead and try to mine it before it hits? Well, so that one I have a very 
personal mixed opinion on. When we mine objects, there's all sorts of chances for us to trigger outgassing and other kinds of things that may change orbits in ways that we uh, may not like the outcomes of. So I think it's better to say, yes, yes, we do have the ability to predict something will hit us several years in advance. This is something that was recently uh, perfected in the public eye with our monitoring of the asteroid Apophis, which for a brief period a few years ago was on the list of potential impactors of the planet Earth. Uh, we knew that given the decades we'd have to prepare, we should be able to protect ourselves from its uh, potentially deadly orbit. Luckily, it turned out its orbit, while coming a little too close for comfort, won't actually hit us. Thank you so much for the follow, Conrad Mutz 27 um, So more likely, instead of mining, we'd want to do something else to move it. Um, now mining, I am a fan of mining near Earth objects that aren't on collision courses and that can't easily be put onto collision courses. Uh, asteroid mining is something that's being developed for our future. Uh, looking to see what other questions Michael Mayer asks. Um, oh, I hope you didn't have any damage from the storms yesterday. So as, as some of you may have seen, those of us located here in Edwardsville, uh, we're dealing with a fairly big storm. Uh, our lead programmer at CosmoQuest, Corey, he and I were out uh, grabbing a beer and talking data analysis because, as you know, sometimes science is best done over a well, an adult beverage. While we were out, um, we ended up staying put during happy hour, which was a good time to have to stay put, uh, due to tornado warnings here in Edwardsville. There were massive blasts of wind, a bunch of planters got knocked over, but none of them seemed to be damaged. And this morning, there's a great deal of tree limbs down, but I didn't see any actual damage, and thank you so much. Uh, for worrying about our area. This is unfortunately just par for this time of year. Um, something has to be exciting in the Midwest. Uh, we do a lot of growing of corn and that is not exciting, but the tornadoes and thunderstorms more than make up for it. Um, so I'm getting reminded in the chat that in September, one of our sister programs, Astronomy Cast, which I co-host with Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, in September, we're going to be recording our 500th episode live in a local theater, and you are invited. Uh, we are inviting all of our Astronomy Cast family, which includes CosmoQuest and Universe Today and the Weekly Space Hangout, and all of these uh, overlapping well, astronomy places. Uh, we are inviting all of you to come to Edwardsville, Illinois on Saturday, September 15th and Sunday, September 16th. We will be spending the 15th in the brew pub where Corey and I sought shelter from tornadoes yesterday. And Sunday, we're going to be at the Wild E Theater. This is going to be two days of science, science discussion, science art, and laughter and beer. And, um, I hope you can come. To learn more, go to astronomycast.com, click on trips, and uh, well, hopefully the next few links will be obvious and you will want to fly out and be part of everything that we're doing. Um, scrolling back down through the chat, um, <laughs> Susie is noting that I have quite often been out driving when I saw tornadoes. Um, Hanny's Vorverp is, is noting, I know Titan has rain, but does it have interesting weather? The atmosphere is so thick. So for those of you who don't know a lot about Titan's weather, this is an amazing world with an extraordinarily thick atmosphere. And this particular world exists at what's called the triple point of methane. This means that methane on various parts of Titan at various times of the year is capable of existing as a vapor, sort of like water vapor here on Earth, as an ice, just like, well, water ice here on Earth, and as a liquid, well, just like lakes, ponds, and oceans, and rain here on our Earth. 
in observing Titan, we haven't yet had the ability to measure winds or look for tornadoes, but we do know that there is dramatic weather on Titan. We have seen snow, we have seen the land darken as it can from rain. We know that there are lakes and stream beds. Um, so yes, it has weather. Uh, we just don't know if it's the kind of weather that leads you to want to seek shelter or the kind that makes you think, hey, this could be fun to go out in. Um, time will tell. Now, here's something to think about. The air on Titan is so thick and the, and the gravity is so low that us mere humans could strap on wings and fly around like birds. We could be Prometheus. Now imagine getting to do that during a snowstorm. This is the kind of thing that is potentially possible. Hey, Dr. WD40, welcome. Um, so uh, other questions, and I'm going to scroll up through the, the chat to see if there's anything higher up that I missed. I saw a question earlier. I unfortunately don't remember who it was from that was commenting on can polarization in general be used to do a lot of different work in astronomy? Yes, the answer is yes. We're constantly looking to map out how light and dust are interacting and if there is dust somewhere by looking at polarization, by having particles that light can scatter off of um, this is one, one of the ways we get polarization. Another is magnetic fields. So looking at these polarized lights, looking at the direction of polarized light, uh, starts to give us hints of kinds of dust, size of dust grains, and also presence of magnetic fields. Um, scrolling up to continue to see if there's anything else I missed. Um, so our instro comments, um, and you didn't at me. Oh, actually you did. It just didn't highlight. Oh, there's an X at the end of my username. Sorry about that, our instro. Um, our instro comments at 1000 degrees Celsius. You're talking about temperatures similar to the lava currently pouring from Hawaii's East Rift Zone. So this is the lava coming from uh, the, I've completely forgotten the name of the volcano, other than it begins with the letter uh, either H or K. I think it's Kilauea Volcano. I could be wrong on that. Um, what is this space rock you mentioned earlier made of that it remains solid at all? I don't actually know, know that. Um, so I think 1000 degrees Celsius is uh, not the temperature inside the earth. I think that's the temperature while the rock is cooling off and not yet solid. Um, and the reason it's able to melt at those temperatures is because it's rich in things with lower melting temperatures like silicas. Um, I suspect that it's a compositional issue and it's also a pressure issue. The temperatures that things liquefy at change based on how much pressure there is on the stuff that is heating up and melting. Um, it may be at low pressures and high temperatures. What you get is cracking instead, which would make sense with their discussion on how this causes uh, basically grains to form on the surface. Um, this is something I need to learn more about. So thank you for asking me a question I don't totally know the answer to. Um, okay, scrolling down to see what else I'm missing. Um, so Dr. D WD40 uh, is asking, would it be possible to send some sort of submarine or boat to Titan? Methane is non-polar, so that would be some problems due to little surface tension and hydrogen bonding. So sort of the, the issue is sending something um, and, and having it last long enough out at the distance of Titan. Once you get down to the base of its atmosphere, thank you so much for the follow, not from around here, um, out, out at the distance of Titan and then 
combined with its really thick atmosphere, you can't rely on solar power at the surface of Titan, and you certainly can't rely on solar power for submarines. Now, we did send the Huygens probe uh, as a um, ride along with the Cassini mission, and Huygens separated and went down and sent us back images from the surface of Titan, but it didn't last very long on the surface because it was battery powered. Right now, we are in the process of spinning up to generate more of the radioisotopes that are needed to fuel our radiothermo generators. These are generators that are powered by the heat released during nuclear decay processes. This is the same kind of uh, reactor that powers the Curiosity rover and powers the now very distant Voyager probes. Um, in order to successfully explore the surface of Titan, we need more of, well, these extraordinary, limited in number and expensive radiothermal generators, RTGs. Um, beyond that, Yes, this is the kind of thing that we're actually working to develop. Now, the reason we're working to develop is more towards being able to explore the under ice oceans on worlds like Europa and Enceladus. But Titan is another candidate for these kinds of explorations. Unfortunately, we don't currently have any new missions planned to go out and visit Saturn. Um, so Titan is... Uh, so uh, Enceladus is out of luck for a while. The Europa Clipper, well, is going to Europa, not to Titan. So, um, yeah, we, we need more spacecraft to be funded. This is part of why, to so many astronomers, the delays and cost overruns of the James Webb Space Telescope are so painful to watch. There is a very limited bus budget for NASA, and we've been looking at essentially a flat or decreasing budget for about the past decade. With this kind of a budget, the expenditures that go to our massive missions, so these are the extraordinarily expensive um, key projects that we all acknowledge we need. We need the James Webb Space Telescope to answer fundamental questions. We needed the ALMA Observatory, the Atacama Large Millimeter Observatory, to be built in Chile to study fundamental questions. Funding continues to go towards the construction of the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. All of these different facilities have huge construction bills. Their operating costs aren't as high a drain on our limited resources. And so while we watch these construction phases drag on, we know we're not going to be able to say, okay, let's start naming new massive key observatories to build because there just isn't the funding. So hopefully we will get James Webb Space Telescope actually out the, out the atmosphere and launched in March of 2021. And we'll be able to start planning our next round of great observatories and great space missions that will go out and be able to do things like return to the outer solar system. Um, so it is time for me to hand off this show to Dr. Matt Richardson, who is teaching Astro 101 to our programmer, Big J. Now, this is a fun and, uh, well, hopefully the kind of learning environment you would like to experience. So all of you stick around as I hang up on my computer and pass things off to Dr. Matt and Big J. Once again, this has been The Daily Space. I will be back on Monday, bringing you new scientific discoveries and announcements from the world of astronomy and space science. If you like what you see, please give us a follow. If you want to sustain our efforts, your subscriptions and every bit really matters. Um, so wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening or afternoon. And remember to get outside and look up. Bye-bye.